Okay, we're on the last chapter, Hebrews chapter 13. And the first verse is, let love of the brethren continue. Now, you know, I'm going to get some awes out of that one. <laughs> yeah, except for probably get a call from a lawyer too. You're using a picture you're not allowed to use. <laughs> well, this passage contains a number of concluding exhortations that promote law-abiding holiness. And the emphasis is very practical, and it reminds us that our faithfulness in Yeshua needs to always show forth in our actions. Now, it, let brotherly love continue. This is a long-standing and powerful command given to us in Leviticus uh, where it says, love your neighbor as yourself, which is Leviticus 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahweh. So look at verse 2 of Hebrews 13. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Now, this actually is a form of the previous verse. Uh, this is another law given in the same chapter in Leviticus, too, by the way. In uh, Leviticus 19, verse 34, it says, The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. We are to treat the stranger as one of our family. Now, when Paul writes, some have unwittingly entertained angels, what do you think he's talking about? When Paul said, some have uh, unwitt unwittingly uh, entertained angels. Oh, okay, but what, do you think he had an example in mind? Yeah, that's my, that's my thought too. Abraham, he entertained the father himself and a couple of angels and... They look like a couple of guys. Yeah. Yeah, that's in uh, Genesis uh, 18, and, and Lot did the same thing in Genesis 19. Now, <clears throat> um, for their obedience to the Torah of Elohim, Abraham was blessed greatly, and Lot's life was spared from the destruction there at Sodom and Gomorrah, if you'll recall. See, that was showing the love of the Father in a very profound way. Verse, uh, verse 3, remember the prisoners as though in prison with them and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves also are in the body. Remember the prisoners as if, as if chained with them. Interesting. You know, that's the same plea Joseph made when he went to, went to, was thrown in prison there in Egypt. In uh, Genesis 40, verses 14 and 15, only keep me in mind when it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house, for I was in fact kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I've done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon. And you remember what that guy did? He forgot, right? <clears throat> Hebrews 13, verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all. And let the marriage bed be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers Elohim will judge. Marriage is honorable among all, and it is to remain undefiled. And the fact is, when two people are married, they become one body, one in spirit. That's the command originally given in, on the sixth day of creation, if you recall. On Genesis 2, starting at verse 21. So Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And Yahweh Elohim fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You know, uh... That's the way it is. Marriage, you become one flesh. That's why in the genealogy of Luke, for instance, we're given the genealogy actually of Joseph's uh, father-in-law. Okay? Why? And people always ask, why? You can't, they shouldn't have done that. Well, sure they should. The two are one. They're showing the branches how 
He came from both sides. But was uh, Joseph considered a son-in-law or a son by his father-in-law? A son. A son. And I can see that. I can see that very well now that my kids are married. I consider my daughters-in-law daughters. I consider my sons-in-law sons. I consider the two are one with my children. That's the way it is. Now, society today trying to turn marriage into something else, I find that ridiculous. You can include people of the same sex. Uh, People, I remember when the uh, same sex argument was out, people were saying, well, now who are you to say what any two people should or should not be married? And I said, well, by definition, but uh, what makes you think the number two is so special? You've got this number two going around, and any number two should be okay. Well, what, what's wrong with six? Okay. Why not 12? Well, now you're being ridiculous. Oh, I'm being ridiculous. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Let's just redefine everything. Uh, you know, whatever society deems acceptable, that's what we should have to swallow. See, that's nonsense there. That is nonsense. You know, the, what I deem acceptable is what uh, the, our Father in Heaven says is acceptable, not, uh, not things that make us feel good. <clears throat> People that, that look at, at things like that, they feel so good about themselves, about being so open-minded. Well, I'm happy for them. Verse 5 of Hebrews 13. Let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. You know, this is a reminder of the 10th commandment, which is Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And that quote here, he says... uh, from Yahweh, I will never leave you nor forsake you, never desert you nor forsake you, is in that translation. That's another quote from the Torah. That's in Deuteronomy uh, 31, verse 6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For Yahweh, your Elohim, is the one who goes with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. And in verse 8, and Yahweh is the one who goes ahead of you. He'll be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Going back to Hebrews 13, verse 6. So that we confidently say, Yahweh is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do to me? This is another reference to a theme that's found in Torah. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, verse 26. There is none like Elohim of Yeshurun who rides the heavens to your help And through the skies in his majesty, and down to verse 29, Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved by Yahweh, who is the shield of your help and the sword of your majesty. So your enemies shall cringe before you, and you shall tread upon their high places. Going back to, oh, and also, uh, it's a reference to several passages in the Psalms, too. In Psalm 27, starting at verse 1, Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? When evildoers came upon me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they stumbled and fell. Though a host encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war arise against me in spite of this, I shall be confident. And in Psalm 118, verses 7 through 10, Yahweh is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in man. It's better to take refuge in Yahweh than to trust in princes. All nations surrounded me. In the name of Yahweh, I will surely cut them off. Okay, Hebrews 13, verse 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of Elohim to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faithfulness. So this is an encouragement to those who speak the word of Elohim to you. Paul says, imitate their faithfulness. Uh, They're the ones that that taught and and consider the outcome of their conduct. Verse 8, 
Yeshua Messiah is the same yesterday and today, yes, and forever. So Yahweh doesn't change. Elohim is the same always. He'll never change. He'll never change his mind. And normally I run across a verse like this, I'll give you a list of 20 verses that back that up. Okay? We're just going to show a few this time. Psalm 102, verses 26 and 27. Even they will perish, but you do endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. You will change them and they'll be changed. But you are the same and your years will not come to an end. Psalm 103, verses 16 and 17. And when the wind has passed over it, it's no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of Yahweh is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him. And his righteousness to children's children. Malachi 3, 6, For I, Yahweh, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. 1 Samuel 15, verse 29, And also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Uh, by the way, I've been told recently, this passage right here, <clears throat> it proves that Yeshua is not a manifestation of the Father. It says Yahweh, uh, Elohim is not a man that he should change his mind. All they're saying is that he's like Elohim, he ain't going to change his mind. Elohim going to change his mind. Well, that's, that's correct. But he's saying here, this is what I was told recently, this is proof that he did not manifest himself as a man. I know, it's not the intent of the passage at all. He's just saying he's not like you and I and, and, and ditzy. <laughs> that's all... That's all it's saying. He is not like the imperfect man that we know. Right. He is different. Right. He's not like you and I. He's not like you and I, but he should change Yeah, and it's like Yeshua said of John the Baptist. Uh, said, well, you were expecting a, a reed swaying in the wind, but you didn't find that with him. That's what he's saying. Okay? He's, he's steadfast. He's faithful. He's not saying he cannot manifest himself as a man. Because he can't change his mind. That's not. <laughs> I know. That's kind of. Is that on the internet? Uh, it was discussions with people who who left the uh, Brit Hadashah and left Messiah. This is one of their proof texts. This is the kind of proof text you got to deal with. That's what they have. Okay. Um, and my response is, well, well, he couldn't manifest himself as a man. That's impossible, isn't it? He couldn't do that, could he? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm wanting them to say no he can't <clears throat> he did it before by the way who wrestled with who, who showed up with Abraham and who wrestled with Jacob I mean I brought those up and I, and I was told well close reading of the text shows that those were just angels I said really well here show me where it says that and I put it on there <clears throat> and then I looked in the Jewish Publication Society and they, they uh, I have their commentary on the Torah which was very good by the way um, you have to keep in mind what side they're coming from, but a lot of good information there and a lot of good wisdom. But uh, they called the meeting with Abraham a theophany. In the, a theophany. A manifestation of the Father. Yeah, theo means God. It is a revelation of the Father. They even said that. So... Um, just thought I'd share that with you. James 1, verse 17, Every good thing bestowed and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Yeah, he doesn't change. He doesn't change his mind. He is faithful. And because he's faithful to his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's why his son came and did what he did and why his spirit, why his breath is poured out on his people because he's faithful going back to Hebrews 13 verse 9 this is this is timely do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings <laughs> for it's good for the heart to be strengthened by grace not by foods through which those who were thus occupied were not benefited um, you know it would appear Paul is dealing with a problem here that he's not really defining all right, varied and strange teachings. Um, he's not specifying exactly what it is. 
Now, uh, other translations say, do not be carried away by varied and strange doctrines. It's the same thing. It, it's a warning against false doctrines, false gods. Uh, that's warned against in the Torah. Deuteronomy 31, starting at verse 16. And Yahweh said to Moses, Behold, you're about to lie down with your fathers, and this people will ar arise excuse me, and play the harlot with the strange gods of the land, into the midst of which they are going, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I'll forsake them and hide my face from them. And they shall be consumed, and many evils and troubles shall come upon them, so that they will say in that day, Is it not because our Elohim is not among us that these evils have come upon us? But I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they will do, for they will turn to other gods. <clears throat> now, he says here, For it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were thus occupied were not benefited. Now, doesn't that sound strange? You know what he's talking about there? Sacrifices. Talk about sacrifices. Sacrifices uh, don't strengthen the heart. Okay? That's not what they were for. And he says, through which those who were thus occupied were not benefited, especially with those who um, rejected Messiah. And I'll, he'll continue here. Verse 10. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Those that reject Yeshua have no claims to the Father. Those that reject Yeshua as Messiah have no claims to the Father. Yeah, their sacrifices are meaningless. Okay, that's, that's what Paul's saying here. And he, he talks about here, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. The carcass of an animal sacrifice was burned outside the camp. In uh, Exodus 29, verse 14, But the flesh of the bull and its hide and its refuse you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. <clears throat> and look at John 19, verses 17 and 18. They took Yeshua, therefore, and he went out bearing his own stake to the place where the, uh, called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him, with him two other men, one on either side, and Yeshua in between. They took him outside the gate, too, and killed him. He's a sin offering, is the point I'm trying to make, just like in Exodus 29, 14. Yeah. The, and you're, you're going to have to excuse me. I'd have to go back and look. I don't recall right off the top of my head. Right. Is, is burnt outside. Right. Right. You take it away because it's a sin offering. <clears throat> look at verses 12 and 13. Therefore Yeshua also that he might sanctify the people through his own blood suffered outside the gate. Hence, let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. So, um, Yeshua suffered outside the camp also. And, like I said, he is our sin offering. In verse 14 of Hebrews 13, uh, 13, For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to Elohim, that is, the fruit of the lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices Elohim is pleased. So we are to offer the sacrifice of praise to him. And it's a kind of offering that can be done at any time. It's not new. It's, uh, it's straight from the Tanakh. In Psalm 50, verse 23, He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of Elohim. Psalm 69, verses 30 and 31. I will praise the name of Elohim with song and shall magnify him with thanksgiving. 
and it will please Yahweh better than an ox or a young bull with horns and hoofs. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and it's it's and it's fine to do that. Of course, you got lots of time to do that. You know what I mean? People have lots of time to sing, and uh, I do it on the way home a lot. Uh, and, and you ought to thank me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you're welcome. <laughs> That's just me and the father. Okay, a little different. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't punish you. So, <clears throat> but yeah, singing is great, and a lot of congregations do sing. We just, we have a lot of scripture to study. There's nothing wrong with singing. That's that's wonderful. Okay, no, nothing wrong at all. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Lewis will sing for us here in just a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah, once he gets tanked up, he'll, he's going to solo for us. He's going to sing some revised Christmas songs for us, and he does a great job every year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Psalm 107, verses 21 and 22. Let them give thanks to Yahweh for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. Uh, Psalm 116, starting at verse 17, To you I offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of Yahweh. I shall pay my vows to Yahweh. Oh, may it be in the presence of all his people. In the courts of Yahweh's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise Yahweh. Psalm 118, verses 19 and 20, Open to me the gates of righteousness. I shall enter through them. I shall give thanks to Yahweh. This is the gate of Yahweh. The righteous will enter through it. And Hosea 14, verse 2, take words with you and return to Yahweh. Say to him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously that we may present the fruit of our lips. And one thing, if, if we're going to pray without ceasing, uh, Paul, if you take the commas out, Paul's talking about giving thanks. Okay. That's, you see, that's what we really ought to be doing. Uh, people think, and a lot of people think prayer is... Uh, um, Tell him that you want a new bicycle for Christmas. And, and when you don't get your new bicycle for Christmas, well, he's not listening to your prayers. Well, uh, if, if you don't get your new bicycle for Christmas, it's because uh, your parents don't think you were that good of a little boy. Okay? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, prayer needs to be thanksgiving. We need to give thanks to him. My gosh, are you still breathing? Are you alive? Look at them clothes you got on. But get in our cars and go home. My and, and the, the heater works. Sheesh. Shelter. Food. I don't know what to eat. We don't have anything to eat at home, but the freezer's full and the big refrigerator's full and the little refrigerator's full. It's just I don't know what to choose. Yeah. You know? Well, we don't have anything to eat. <laughs> uh, you got an oven, got a microwave oven. Got a big screen TV, got a little TV, got a TV in the kitchen. I don't have a TV in the bathroom yet, but, I mean, well, yeah, I mean, we've been blessed a lot more than what we deserve. I mean, goodness gracious. And what does he ask out of us? Love one another, would you please? Okay, just love one another, get along. Take care of one another. Take care of one another. Yeah, be thankful when going through hard times. You know, you know when we go through hard times, that's when we're getting stronger. That's right. We don't get any better unless we go through hard times. And that's that's it. Yeah, do a good day's work and enjoy some food and drink. Hey, that's what life. How do you get satisfaction in life? Where is satisfaction? What's that come from? I can't think of where you get satisfaction anywhere in life except an accomplishment in getting something done. You know, that's the only place you really have satisfaction. You know, as far as contentment. Huh, yeah, got that done. It's, we got to keep those things in mind. You know, we don't get satisfaction through the, you know, the new toy we buy. 
that new toy we buy, let's face it, the fun wears off and the payments wear on. Don't they? Mm-hmm. So, let's be, yeah, let's, uh, he doesn't ask that much and he provides so well for us. Going back to Hebrews 13, verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we're sure that we have a good conscience, desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things. And I urge you, urge you to all the more to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. This is speaking of teachers, leaders, uh, not, not kings and presidents in this case. He wants people to pray for him and that he be brought, uh, brought to them sooner. Verses 20 and 21. Now the Elohim of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Yeshua our master, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. Through Yeshua Messiah, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, he's, he's praying that Elohim would make us complete in, uh, if you look at the New King James, it says, in every good work to do his will. Now, how would he make us complete in every good work to do his will? How does he do that? Yeah. Look how this is worded in particular. Compare it to uh, 2 Timothy 3, starting of, uh, at verse 14. You, however, continue, talking to Timothy, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them. Now, he learned from his mama. Now, Paul wrote good things about his mama, such as a very faithful woman, and so was his grandmother. <clears throat> And he continues, uh, and keep in mind, his father was, uh, was a Greek. That's why, by the way, that's why Paul had to circumcise Timothy in Acts 16. It's because they wouldn't circumcise him because he was half Greek and half Jew. The rabbis there wouldn't do it. So Paul did it. We write in the, from, uh, he writes in that from childhood, you've known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faithfulness which is in Messiah Yeshua. What sacred writings is he talking about? Well, just the, yeah, just the Tanakh. It's all he had. Okay? He didn't have the book of Matthew. Or Luke. Yeah, he didn't have nothing <clears throat> like that. He says all scripture. When he says all scripture, what's he talking about? The Tanakh. Yeah. Is inspired by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of Elohim may be equipped or adequate, equipped for every good work. <clears throat> that's what he's. That's why I say this is another. The all, Paul's the author of Hebrews too. Things like this. Okay, make you complete in every good work to do as well. That's through His Word and through the breath of the Father that we're able to do this. Verses twenty-two and twenty-three. But I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I've written to you briefly. Take notice that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom, if he comes soon, I shall see you. Once again, Timothy is mentioned here <clears throat> in this letter. That's why, once again, I, I say Paul wrote this letter to the Hebrews. Now, Paul loved Israel. He loved his people. And he wanted them to turn to the Father, or turn to Yeshua as Messiah, too. And, and I'm sure that's why he wrote this letter. Then he finishes, greetings, or greet to uh, all of your leaders and, and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. So uh, we know he was from southern Judah. He ended with a you all. So, uh, you see, Paul wrote this in order to help convince the Hebrews that uh, Yehoshua is the Messiah. And he hit on some very specific points that they, that they had to take note of because they witnessed the father say, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. 
There were many witnesses to those things. Now, that was the father himself saying that. And he, he starts off there saying, he didn't say that to an angel ever. Okay? He's greater than the angels. And then he brought up that uh, passage in Psalm 110, which is very strange. If you, just, if, you, if you think about it, by itself, without Messiah, and in Psalm 110, the reason he brings it up is because he knows that Yeshua brought it up to the Pharisees. Psalm 110, a psalm of David, very important. This is a psalm of David. Yahweh says to my Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, and we've talked about this before, but this psalm, this is a, this is a pinnacle of a psalm here. And Yeshua says, uh, Who's the Messiah? Isn't he the son of David? They said, yeah. They said, well, then why in Psalm 110, he references it, he didn't say Psalm 110. Why does he say, why does he call him Adonai? Why does he call him Master if he's David's son? Well, that's a good question. He can't be a, just a person then. Uh, who refers to their son as Master? You don't do that. And he says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. So he's seeing that vision, and he's looking at this conversation between Elohim and the Messiah, the Messiah. And they know this is the Messiah, too, by the way. Uh, I was reminded, well... Moshiach, it just means anointed one. There was a lot of anointed ones. All kings were anointed. All high priests were anointed. Sure, sure. There's a lot of anointed ones in Scripture. Uh, Moses, David, Aaron, lots, lots of them. But there was one that's the anointed one. There's the Moshiach. And the ancient sages knew it. The ancient sages, before there's an axe to grind, knew it. In the Tanakh, when it's talking about the Messiah, and here is another spot where they wrote, it's talking about the Messiah. It says, your people will volunteer freely in the day of your power, in holy array from the womb of the dawn. Your youth are to you as the dew. Yahweh is sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> well, now, why did he bring Melchizedek into this? Yeah, no beginning and end, and uh, he's just one that appeared to Abraham. And how was he a priest of the Most High before there was a priesthood? Well, all these things are answered if you realize Yeshua is Messiah. Okay. All these things are answered. <clears throat> um, he's uh, son of David. Uh, the, the evidences of him as Messiah and having to be a manifestation of the Father has to be a manifestation of the Father. Why did David call him Adonai? Why did David call him Master? <clears throat> How was he a priest after the order of Melchizedek who, you know, had no beginning or end and um, how is he, and, and I mentioned this to y'all last week, how will those who deny Messiah real, think that their Messiah is the son of David? Because he said so? Who was a prophet like Moses? There's only one answer to that. Yeah. <clears throat> And how was he a prophet like Moses? Uh, I, could, I could write, books have been written about it. I could write one, but others have been written too. They missed some things, but there's probably only 100, 150 things you could write as to how he's a prophet like Moses. <clears throat> and what did it say about that prophet like Moses? Remember? You will listen to him. Because you're going to be accountable for the words, for my words that come out of his mouth. 
You're going to be accountable for those. <clears throat> well, how will you know the prophet like Moses when he shows up? Well, you know, he could go for 40 days without food and water in the wilderness. Uh, he could, uh, he could uh, battle Satan using the words of Moses. Uh, he, he could be uh, taken out of Egypt. He, there's, there's a number of ways. He could speak to the Father and have his face shine, just like Moses did. Like when he walked on the water and they, everyone thought he was a ghost. Why do you think that was on the third watch of the night? In the storm. Yeah, because he was glowing. Yeah, they thought it was a ghost. It's because he went face to face with the Father, just like Moses did. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the answer. Okay. Uh, who, <laughs> who showed up as Messiah on April 6, 32 AD, just as prophesied by Daniel? Who did that? Uh, only one, only one guy showed up on that day. They should have known that. They should, they should have known all these things. But here's the problem. Here's what happened. It was in Acts 13. You can read about it. It says Paul was teaching in the synagogue and to the, to the Jews. And they heard this and they said, oh my goodness, this is awesome. This is, you're right, this is it. This is the answer. Okay, we want to hear more. We can't wait for the next Sabbath. Well, the next Sabbath, Paul invited who? The Gentiles. And then they said, no. No, 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 no. They're not allowed. That we're, they're not a part of us. Uh, they haven't converted to Judaism. Uh, and then they said, everything Paul said is wrong. Denied everything Paul said all of a sudden. <clears throat> and it snowballed from there. It snowballed from there. Any, uh, any questions, any thoughts? That's why Paul wrote this, is to convince, to help convince the Hebrew people. <clears throat>